Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to a another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have a really luscious harvest of various franchises to discuss with some pretty positive news overall. Now, you may notice that Bob the Skull has been replaced over my shoulder. We had a bit of a falling out. You know, Fist Sorceress ain't that bad. So now we have Robert, the better, glowier skull. How's it going, Robert? Just hating fist sorceress. Fantastic. Robert knows better than to disagree with a goblin. Now this really is a jam-packed episode of Fantasy News. No sponsors or nothing. We are just diving head on in. So let's go ahead and start off with the crazy amount of Wheel of Time news we got over the weekend due to the Comic-Con panel. Let's start off with the fact that yes, we had a whole ass clip from episode one drop and give us essentially Moraine's arrival at the Wine Spring Inn. I was a fan of this. I liked it. More Roseman's looking pretty Moraney, and I think the characterization throughout really lined up with what I'm looking for. I still don't love the look of the show in terms of the way it's being shot. I did a bunch of research and had people tell me it's frame rate stuff. Now I have people telling me it's lighting stuff. I don't know. There's just something that's bugging me, but I probably will adjust and get used to it or it'll improve as the show goes on. And yeah, I especially liked the music and overall like set design. That really impressed me. And let's go ahead and talk about music because we also had our first single drop from the Wheel of Time show called For the Flame. It's chanted in the old tongue and let's go ahead and get a bit of a music review going, shall we? Hi everyone, Danthony Green Tano here, the internet's busiest fantasy nerd. And today we're going to be talking about All Nato, the first single drop for the upcoming Wheel of Time show. Now, this was written by uh, Lorne, who is well known within the community of Wheel of Time fans, and sets a tone for the upcoming Wheel of Time show that I think many people will find to be quite interesting. It's not the most revolutionary track we've ever seen for a fantasy TV show, but it manages to be a bit distinct and have its own personality, which I know many fans of the upcoming Wheel of Time show are very much so looking for. We have a uh, rhythmic chanting in the background where they are going over lyrics that essentially are seen as a mission statement for the White Tower, a seat of power within the Wheel of Time. I thought it did a really good job of having an ethereal feel that fits into such a high fantasy magical landscape. I would have liked to see a bit more done with the instrumental. This is meant to act as a palette setter and I think it accomplishes that job quite well. Overall, I'm feeling a decent to light six on this one, transition. That's the best Fantano you can get from me. I, I can't do any better Fantano than that. Now, a few more small things. There was, of course, a Zoom call with a bunch of the cast and showrunners involved and a poster, which I also was not a huge fan of, but I did like the song and yeah, that clip overall I'm positive with. I'll say here about the poster what I said in my live stream reaction. It has very good concepts. I like how colorful and vibrant it is. I'm really tired of overly gritty posters, but the compositioned end vision just did not work out too well. And this version they put out, I think is way better. This should have been the poster overall. Now the most requested story of the week by, by far, far, I thought it would be the reaction to the House of the Dragon trailer that dropped, but no, it is Critical Role's Vox Machina intro, surprisingly. I've never really covered these people because they're way larger than me and I don't really feel the need to get into it, but to satisfy the people, yeah, they, they had their little intro and it was extremely energetic, so. Yay. But speaking of House of the Dragon, yes, let's go ahead and talk about that teaser we got given on to us. And this is the show that might have like the most pressure put on it in terms of saving a franchise in the history of television. As I've covered before in various TikToks and videos, the IP that is Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire since season eight has tanked in value. A lot of merch that's just not been bought up and abandoned deals because they really can't give it away, at least from the reports I'm seeing. And now House of the Dragon is what seems like the best shot at possibly bringing this franchise back into the 
zeitgeist, something that is valued. Obviously, the books still sell well. I'm talking exclusively about stuff that's related to the show. So what do you think? Do you think this will actually be able to bring a lot of value back to a franchise that has been massively deflated due to the ending that season eight had? I could get a lot deeper into this and do a whole video on the various news sources and stuff I've seen about like clothing lines that we're gonna do, like rollouts of Game of Thrones stuff that are just like, Never mind. The market research shows no one wants this anymore. But just drop a percentage in the comments down below. From one to a hundred, how much of a chance do you think House of the Dragon has to redeeming Game of Thrones? Man, that seems like a really big ask for a show. But it looked okay. I had no immediate huge issues with it. And hell, to the show's credit, it does not have D&D involved, and the like to dislike ratio is Pretty nice, actually. I was expecting this to be way more in the negative direction. And to end this with a compliment to the trailer, I really like the redesign of the Iron Throne. It set a tone that actually, like, just in that set piece alone made me go, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. I like the implication there. So maybe, maybe, maybe I like it. I don't know. And in the most clickbaited headline of the week that I saw, we had plastered across the internet, Superman comes out as Bye, which is the oversimplified version of John Kent has come out as bisexual, which is an iteration on Superman, a new version that is not Clark Kent. And they're simplifying it to either one, purposely outrage people who are the always outraged every time someone comes out as gay or, you know, redesigned in some way that makes them non white. Those people are going to be angry, so this is trying to target them for engagement. Turns out a ton of news websites actually depend on you not reading the content to get angry and drive their engagement. That's a very real thing. But I view this as very similar to Miles Morales. There was the idea batted around for a while of making Peter Parker black, and then some people were like, no, I'd hate that. So then Marvel was like, all right, well then here's a new character that is. And now it seems like they're doing something similar with Superman, where yeah, people would be mad if he was suddenly bi, so instead they're taking John Kent and going, well, he's bi then. And then some people are still gonna be mad about that because they're homophobic. And then there'll be others who go, great, some representation and move on because they're mature adults who have better things to do with their lives. <laughs> As a bi person, recently bi person, I don't know. My general take on this kind of stuff is usually just like, cool, but will we be getting a live action openly bi John Kent movie anytime soon? I doubt it. I still laugh often about Disney patting themselves in the back being like, oh, Rise of Skywalker will have an open LGBTQ plus character in it. And then it's it's a woman kissing another woman in the background for half a second so they could cut it out for foreign box office. Passive progressivism, yay! I'm being too negative. This is bi representation when bi erasure is extremely common. So good on you, DC. And thanks for, you know, making another prominent superhero label go on a bi character. I do appreciate it. Thank you. And for fans of the graphic novel series Saga, we are officially getting its return in 2022. Not just 2022. January 2022, which is well, far closer than I assumed this would be when I heard it was returning. Let me know in the comments down below if this should be jumped way up my TBR for manga slash graphic novels because it's one that's kind of been echoing around the outer atmosphere of the channel for quite some time. And now, Star Trek news, which is not the story of the day that's actually going to make me angry. No, 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 this one, I am okay with it because it seems with the multiple more child, young, you know, targeted Star Trek pieces of media we're getting coming out that the whole franchise is kind of trying to get at that younger audience and pull them on into the ideas that are Star Trek. And I'm actually okay with that because we had a trailer drop for Star Trek Prodigy which is an animated kids show with Janeway as a holographic captain. And you know what? That's cool. I like anything science oriented targeted to kids to get them more into science and learning and potentially leading to careers in STEM because that's a real thing. Kids get inspired and they end up in fields they wouldn't have otherwise. And that's all positive. I just, I, I accept this is the legacy of Star Trek on one condition. You actually make it pretty sciencey and use that 
in the narrative to get kids interested in science. If you don't do that, and this just turns into <laughs> fart joke, bad, dumb Star Trek, I will find all of your family members and I will put them on the bottom of a big rig truck and drive down the highway for hours. That's, that'll be what I do if you f this up. <laughs> because I've accepted, we will never get the pinnacle of TNG being what Star Trek is again. It's not gonna happen, but I can accept Star Trek being molded into an actual science-based, interesting, targeted towards kids pieces of media. That's fine. Just stop dumbing it down. Please. But speaking of science fiction, we also had the foundation officially renewed for a season two over at Apple TV Plus, or God, that's an annoying name, mon whatever, moving on. And uh, I put up my review of episode one, which I found to be a mixed bag. And then I watched episode two and I was like, oh, that was a step down. And then I watched episode three and I was like, wow, that was even, Bigger step down, I regret recommending that to people. So my review of so far, I've seen episodes one, two, and three are one was fine, two was not fine, three was bad. I do believe in giving seasons of television the full season. So I'm going to finish before I judge. And I know this is not technically science fiction news, but it's science history news, and it's Christopher Nolan who's made some science. It's just, it counts. Let me talk about this because I'm really excited that Killian Murphy is going to be starring in Christopher Nolan's next movie about Oppenheimer. That's right, the development of the nuclear bomb. <laughs> That's so, oh, just, oh. I in general, I think Christopher Nolan is a bit overhyped as a director, but Killian Murphy with this premise and this director, a bit overhyped does not mean bad, is something that I am excited for. I am really going to be keeping an eye on this and to all my sci-fi nerds, I imagine in general, you're just like a science nerd as well, like me, this, this is cool, right? Like you gotta be pumped about that. And you know, they're going to include Oppenheimer saying, I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, now I am become deaf the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. And we got another trailer for Blade Runner Black Lotus, which looked a little bit better than the last trailer we got. And the biggest improvement, if you compare them, is they seem to be really focusing on trying to up the level of the animation. The animations in this trailer still seem pretty inconsistent in how it looked. It was actually kind of jarring to go from like one shot that looked pretty good, bouncing over to another and seeing that shot look kind of bad. Uh, so I'm hoping by the time this is actually out, we can get an entire trailer that's full of actually decent looking animation. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, the comments and like ratio on this seem to be pretty positive, but I'm gonna dissent. I don't think this is gonna live up to the Blade Runner uh, legacy. It just, I'm out, I'm out. I don't need to be hyped for everything. This one I'm out, skeedowtskies. Right, Robert? Oh, sure, yep. Yeah, I got a, I got a better co-host now. F you, Bob. And in the final story we're going to be covering here today, this is the one. This is the one that's gonna make me a bit upset because we had the first image drop for Timothy <laughs> as Wonka in his upcoming Willy Wonka movie. And Tim, you know better than this. He dog, Timoni, Timothy. Uh, stop it. No. You are better than this. Get out and do whatever you can do to make sure this movie does not come out with your name on it because you cannot live up to the original. And we already know what happens when you try to capture lightning in a bottle twice. If you look into the production of Welly Wonka, it was a miracle. It came out, Gene Wilder was, Who wanted a Willy Wonka? The character's mysticism and the like not knowing of him are what make. Rebels Creed's gonna be out October 29th. Peruder links down below if you'd like to. Like and subscribe if you have not already. Hit the Patreon if you wanna support what I do here. And have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreon, Sasquatch Barbecue. I hope I can come to that. Zoe and Brandon Vizovki. Vizovki, I think I said that right.